Welcome to another edition of the 1% Better Podcast with your host, Rob O'Donoghue. Hey folks, welcome to another 1% Better and this one is one I've been looking forward to for a while with my my guest on the other side of our, our Zoom video here, audio for you guys. He is a uh, multiple hats i guess he's wearing a hat right now as well uh in in reality uh philanthropist author keynote speaker but i would say most importantly uh cancer survivor two-time cancer survivor because i think that's so important if if you didn't come through those we wouldn't be talking uh and then obviously from there climbing a lot of big mountains uh and uh doing a lot of other things so welcome to the podcast sean swarner lovely to have you on I appreciate it, Rob, and, and uh, thanks for the opportunity. The reason I'm wearing a hat is because I think I have quarantine hair, and it's just, it's awful. <laughs> I haven't had a haircut in months. I'm a bit similar to you at the moment. I uh, I bought one of those um, buzz, buzzers or the, the, the clippers a, a few weeks ago and had kind of a very obvious step at one stage between my hair on the top and, and down below. So it uh, it's coming back now, and, and the Irish hairdressers are opening in Ireland next week, so probably will get to them at some point in about a month's time when the the cues die down a little bit <laughs> but great to have you along looking forward to hearing your story and hopefully i always try and hope that we go into areas that you mightn't have explored that much before because obviously with your background and some of the achievements you have you've done a lot of podcasts i would imagine um so it's always good to kind of tap into new stuff or, or new areas if that's if that that comes up for us of course. No, I appreciate it. I, I, I love a challenge, you know, overcoming two terminal cancers. Uh, I, I see life from a little different perspective and I like those challenges. Well, I don't know if this uh, questioning are going to challenge you that much, but uh, hopefully we'll, we'll see what comes <laughs> up. Um, so, so, Sean, when I was doing the research, I was fascinated by lots of things. One of them, though, that really stood out, and I'm sure you get this a lot, one voted one of the top eight most inspirational people of all time. How, how does that feel when you get that uh, tagline around you? You, you know, I, I appreciate you bringing that up. And, and the first time I actually read that, I was going through it, and I think there's other people like Winston Churchill and, and Bruce Lee. And I'm thinking the person who, who put that list together and included me, maybe they got to the end of it, and they, that, that's when they'd had a few too many pints. And they're thinking to themselves, ah, I need to add someone else on there, so we'll just we'll throw Sean in there. <laughs> that's great. And do you know how, how that came about, and who, who, who was the person that was putting the list together? I'd be interested in, in knowing about that. You know, I, I, that, that's a great question. I don't know off the top of my head. But there is uh, another list where I am uh, listed with Winston Churchill, um, Sir Richard Branson, uh, like I said, Bruce Lee, and some others. And it's just it's it's random. Every once in a while, something that like like that'll come up, and I'm assuming they include me in there because they have maybe a personal relationship to cancer themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, because it it really touches people at a core level and, and at their hearts. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a great one to have, and it's not one that would easily come by right if there's only eight people on the list uh, they must have done something special so maybe talk a little bit about your yourself right now what what goes on in your world right now what you're about and then we can go back in time a little bit oh of course right right now i uh <clears throat> i have been home I've, I've haven't i've never been home this long in the past 15 years you know, I'm, I'm usually a, a, a keynote motivational speaker to corporations around the world. And last year I traveled, uh, I want to say 250,000 miles on American Airlines and, and the One World folks. So I'm, I'm, I'm jumping out of my skin to leave and just to, to go somewhere to do something. Mm -hmm. uh, but here in Colorado, we, we've been under quarantine now. I've, I've been in my house probably for the past, uh, wow, since the end of February. Mm -hmm. So I'll, it's, it's not such an exciting life that I'm living at this moment, but normally, you know, I'm out running around, I'm doing things. I, uh, I was supposed to be going over to Africa again yesterday. My flight was supposed to leave. However, because of what's going on in the world, we had to change that. And the reason I go to Africa is every year I take a group up Kilimanjaro as a fundraiser for a cancer charity. Mm -hmm. And the cancer charity pays for a survivor to go. Anyone can, can go. We just use it as a survivor, as a fundraiser for survivors. And then the survivor that we cover his costs or her costs 
it's that person's responsibility to pay it forward to raise funds for next year's survivor. Mm -hmm. So we're leaving uh, the end of July. I'm leaving July 26 now. You know, fingers crossed that everything's going to be okay. But uh, otherwise, it's um, I've, I've been sitting in, well, standing, as you can see, standing behind my desk, working on a program called the Summit Challenge, where it's going to be helping people tap into the personal core values and help them basically live uh, an unrestricted and uh, unstoppable life. Mm -hmm. And just on COVID-19 and the, the lockdown we've been on everywhere across the globe, you're two-time cancer survivor from your story i know you've only got one lung which you probably can talk a little bit about as well does that put you in, in a kind of a higher risk category uh for covid i'm a type 1 diabetic so i would be in a higher risk category and that obviously adds extra restrictions in ireland the kind of cocooned people for a period of time that were high risk or over a certain age has that put more kind of concerns around things for you you know i, I don't know if anyone's been tested, you know, to, to be in that high risk category if they if they do have one lung. Yeah, I just I don't want to find out. Mm -hmm. You know, it, personally speaking, I if I, I don't want to find out what happens to someone with one lung if they get the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing the best I can to stay away from everyone except for my wife. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very good, and she has to stay on lockdown. I'm sure with you there <laughs> as well. Um, so let's go back then. Let's talk about, you mentioned core values and something I do a lot of work on as well in kind of coaching and trying to help people understand what they are. When you were growing up, did you have a good sense of your core values? Were you clear on what you were about, knowing yourself? Maybe talk to me a bit about life in the early stages. Oh, I, I think so. And I think they were instilled in me uh, from my parents. I, I grew up in a small town called Willard, Ohio. And it was, I was your typical Midwest boy. My, my backyard was a bean field or a cornfield, depending on the season. And hindsight being 2020, I'm thinking maybe that had something to do with it, with the pesticides that the farmers used. Mm. May have that, maybe that was one of the reasons you know, why I got one of the cancers. Um, but I, I was your typical kid. I was... Uh, I don't know if it's too popular in, uh, across the pond, but you know, we would toilet paper our, uh, our track coach's yard, which now that's that's probably a, a mortal sin because <laughs> toilet paper is so expensive or it's so hard to find now. Mm -hmm. But we had a, a great time, and uh, I just became more resourceful to to do those crazy things and not get caught. So I was I was your typical Midwest child growing up. But I think my, my parents instilled in me one of the main things that stuck with me um, through sports and, and all the education they gave me through encouraging me to be my, my best self was I never had to be the best. I just had to be my best. Mm -hmm. And they encouraged me by setting goals. And let's say the 50, 50 meter breaststroke. And my goal, my, my personal record was 35 seconds. The next, the next meet, I wanted to go 34 seconds or 33 seconds and slowly get better and better and better. And I think that's one of the things that they instilled in me. And also with, with the Midwest, you know, I, I do have those intrinsic values from my, my parents that really just guided me to be um, a caring, adventurous, loving, supportive person. Mm, very, <clears throat> excuse me, very interesting. And Obviously, coming out at a young age, were you aware of them? Were you aware of what those values were, or was it a later point in life when they became very clear? Yeah, I would say that they came out later in life. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons is because, you know, I had my first cancer at 13. Uh, they gave me three months to live. My second cancer at 16, they gave me 14 days to live. I was in a medically induced coma for a year, and I don't even remember being 16 years old. So I think from 13 to essentially 17 years old, my life was on pause. I, I was focused on survival. There were nights I went to bed not even knowing if I was going to wake up the next morning. So when I was getting ready for school, my friends were worried about the nicest hairstyles, the nicest clothes, you know, being popular. I was worried about literally living. So at, at, at a young age, when you're developing this, this concept of self, you know, and a concept of the future... I, I developed a different perspective based on on what I was going through and what my world was doing to me. Mm -hmm. So I think that's that's one of the reasons I see things a little bit differently than most people now. No, absolutely. And I actually interviewed a, one of the first episodes I did a few years ago, a gentleman from here in Ireland. He, at the age of, I think it was 11 or 12, got cancer as well. And he had to get a, an ankle amp 
amputated from the ankle down and then it came back and he had to get amputated from from the knee uh, or, or above the knee down um survived and now plays uh, football like soccer um and and, and does 5k's you know he, he has a, um one one uh prosthetic leg but but doesn't stop him from you know getting on with life and um and very much the story of resilience that came out there and we talked a lot about that and i'm interested you said 13 and then 15 again you know practically given days weeks to live was there without doubt the resilience but what what was it i suppose that in those years of 13 to 17 or that you said were on pause while life wasn't going in a certain direction you were obviously building the resilience or or there was factors or external factors helping you move forward and and instilling it do you remember kind of standout moments during that period of time that when you reflect back saying well that was a huge a huge moment as i look back Absolutely. My, my family was always there supporting me. So I was, I was truly blessed to have that uh, as, as my, my, my net in case something happened. And there was a moment when I remember uh, I was 60, 70 pounds overweight and I was going in for a swimming practice. And obviously I I couldn't get in the water because I had what's called a Hickman catheter, which was a permanent IV that stuck out of my chest Mm -hmm. and I couldn't submerge that. I could take a shower, but I had to clean it. Uh, but I couldn't get in the water and submerge it. And like I said, I was 60 pounds overweight, bald from head to toe, 13, 14 years old at this point. And I have a younger brother, three years younger than me. So he was 10, 11 years old. And I remember people talking behind my back. Ooh. They were saying, you know, who's, who's the new kid? Who's the fat kid? You know, who's, who's the ugly troll? And that, that hit me right at the core. I mean, I, I wanted to, to cry, but then I didn't find this out until later. I, my, my brother actually went over to the people who were making fun of me and explained exactly what was going on. You know, he told them the reason I was fat and overweight and, and the reason I looked the way I did was because I was going through chemotherapy and the prednisone swelled my body up, the steroids swelled my body up. And he asked them the questions essentially like, you know, if, if you got cancer or if you looked like that, would you like people making fun of you? How would you feel if that happened? You know, a, a, a younger brother who's 10, 11 years old. Mm. I mean, I, I, he's the best brother ever. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, that's tough. And it obviously still, when you reflect back, it's still, I suppose, ha- is raw, I, I would imagine, when you think about that. But it, but you've turned it into a positive, I guess. And, and that's a real standout positive mental attitude. Do you remember when you started to develop that more to to kind of make strides forward when you started to kind of have maybe more self belief or or self efficacy i suppose that that you were going in the right direction absolutely the the again going back to the cancers, I remember one morning I woke up and you know how sometimes you sit on the edge of your bed and, and you use your feet as counterbalance or counterweight to help pull you up. And I did that. And as I was standing up, I remember looking off to my left and actually seeing on my pillow, it it was covered in hair. And I knew the treatments were really going to be helping me or going to be helping me lose my hair. They're helping me, excuse me, they're helping me get better, but they're going to make me lose my hair. Mm -hmm. And I remember running to the bathroom and staring at myself in the mirror, trying to comb it over, trying to fix it, trying to hold on to it and prevent it from falling out. And I, I knew it was inevitable. So I went into the shower, I turned on the shower and I stood there. And at, at that point it felt really odd because it didn't feel like the water was hitting my hair and soaking through like it normally did. This time it was just hitting my scalp and I could feel it hitting my skin. And every time I brought my hands down from washing my head, they were covered in hair. Wow. And I remember at that moment, I literally collapsed to my hands and my knees like I said earlier, I was, I was 60, 70 pounds overweight and I was literally on my hands and knees weeping and I was pulling chunks of hair out of the drain so the water could go down. And it was in that moment, I started thinking about what my friends were going through. You know, like I said earlier, he was probably uh, my neighbor too, let's say across the street, two houses down. He was worried about the nicest shoes and being popular. And it was in that moment that I realized that none of that mattered to me. Mm -hmm. But I also thought, that I had a choice. You know, I could either choose to, to fight for my life or give up and die. Mm. And I knew the second one wasn't an option, but that in that same moment of utter despair, 
I remember thinking to myself that I didn't want to focus on not dying. I actually wanted to focus on living. Mm -hmm. So it's just changing my perspective there. And I can only imagine what would have happened with my life. I I wouldn't be here if I kept telling myself, don't die, don't die, don't die. Mm -hmm. You know, I kept telling myself I wanted to live. I wanted to survive. Mm -hmm. I was going after things that I wanted. I didn't, I wasn't avoiding what I didn't want. Mm -hmm. And that is hugely important language twist, right? That, as you know, as a coach and a a speaker or, or anyone that's trying to, go after the things they want rather than avoid the things they don't want. And the, the mind doesn't understand the not part, I guess. And, you know, you a- automatically start, um, I suppose, self-fulfilling prophecy in, in a way there. How important at that time or even in the, the months and after you started to recover, had you had you therapy? Had you somebody to, to talk to outside your family? Because family are always going to be there. Um, but But people that were, you know, like therapists to deal with the trauma because there's a lot of trauma going on there, right? Absolutely. Unfortunately, my uh, (laughs) kind of tongue in cheek, my therapy was, you call it university, we call it college. But my therapy was when I went to college and turned into an animal house, uh, Belushi character. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) No, I I lost my my high school years and uh, I wanted to relive everything that was stolen from me. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I went to college and I, I turned into a, a party animal, enjoyed every moment. And uh, I don't know if you've ever tried to pass a, a, a college exam of, of immunology without studying and being a party animal. It, it doesn't work too well. <laughs> mm. So I, I found my own path, I suppose. And uh, after, after college, I was accepted into a number of grad schools. And that's when I think it really hit me. There was a moment I was driving from Ohio down to Florida where I was going, where I was accepted into a doctor program to be a, a psychologist. And I wanted to be a psycho-oncologist, a, not call it, a psychologist for cancer patients. Mm-hmm. And I remember while I was driving down there, about an 18-hour drive, I think, and I was maybe nine hours into it. So I, I could have kept going, but I, I experienced something I've, I've I never had before. And I, I, at this at, still to this day, I think it was a panic attack. Mm. I pulled over, I got myself a hotel room and I just stood in the bathroom staring at myself in the mirror for hours, asking myself, what the F are you doing? What the F are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Because I didn't even know, because I, I never looked back at myself and, and everything that I had been through. Mm-hmm. You know, here I was, I was going down to study, to be a psychologist for cancer patients, yet I hadn't worked through my own issues. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that was the, the, one of the biggest changing moments of my life when I realized, Hey, I can't help others until I help myself. Mm. And, and, and like, absolutely. I think that like all cliches there, they stay around for a long time because they, there's truth in them, right? So love yourself, understand yourself before you can really look after anyone else. And I, I attest to that for sure. What did you do next then? What did you start to do to kind of understand yourself or, or look after yourself or, you know, be clear or understanding to yourself? Well, I, I think it was it was over time when I just started looking at what was most important to me. You know, I, I had another turning point when I was actually in school. I was working three jobs, working, uh, attempting to earn my, my master's and my doctor, which I, I, I highly do not recommend to anybody. <laughs> mm-hmm. I think I slept two hours a night, if that. And I was bartending at uh, a place once. And on the way home, uh, I had a young lady in the car. And I, I actually had to carry her up three flights of stairs because she passed out. And uh, when I was kicking on the door, someone finally opened it up and, and I just shoved her because she was in my arms, shoved her at, at the lady who opened the door. And I just asked her, does she belong here? <laughs> and I remember when I dropped her off in the chair, I carried it inside, dropped her off with, with her friends. And as I was leaving, I saw on the coffee table, lines of cocaine, heroin needles, spoons, every, every pills, you name it. And I, I'll, I'll mention right now, I've never done that, never will. But I think that was one of my turning points where I was on my way home thinking, okay, if I don't take control of my life, eventually it will go down that way. And I think that was the moment I decided I wanted to take control of where my future was going, where my life was going. And I knew that most of the time we're all mostly, I would say, on cruise control. We're not really making conscious decisions. 
So that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to start making conscious decisions for my future self because who I wanted to be in the future wasn't who I was now. And I had to start acting like my future self in the present. And that's when I decided I wanted to give back to the cancer community and become uh, the first cancer survivor to climb Mount Everest. And what was the first step you took straight after that? Because a lot of the time we we take those moments of clarity in a way and say, right, I'm going to become this and have this you know, high aspirational goal, but then a lot of people just, you know, go back into the, the autopilot. What, what was the kind of first steps you took to start moving forward? And you mentioned this kind of idea of small changes over time, which falls nicely into 1% better mindset. What, what were those things that you uh, started to get that momentum going with? The, great question. The, the first thing I did was I, I don't know if I emailed my brother or I called my brother. He was just graduating from college and he wanted, he, he moved down with me and I told him, Hey, look, I want to be the first survivor to climb Everest. So I think I, I the first thing I did was I, I put it out there. Mm-hmm. I let him know. And then the second thing was I started reaching out to corporations because I'm, I'm sure, as you know, Everest is, is not exactly a, an inexpensive endeavor. Mm-hmm. So I started reaching out to corporations and telling them, Hey, I'm climbing Mount Everest. And literally I was going to be climbing Everest. Mm, 10 months from when I decided to do it. Had you a profile or just like, what was your shape or were you in good shape at that time? Had you, had you anything like if I rang up uh, organizations right now and said like, I'm a type one diabetic, and I want to be the first to, to climb Everest. I probably wouldn't be left because I think the insulin probably would freeze up there or something. So, but, but uh, you know, what, what gave you the right to do that or the right to engage with those organizations? I'm interested to know what, you know, what was going on for you at that time before, just before taking that first step? Well, not, not honestly, nothing gave me the right to do it. I, I can't tell you how many corporations I approached and how many doors closed in my face. Like for, for 99 corporations that, that closed their doors and said, no, one would say yes. I mean, let, let's, let's just pretend for a second that you're a, a well-known outdoor uh, clothing line company. Mm-hmm. And I approach you and say, hey, I have zero climbing experience. I have one functioning lung. And in nine months, I'm going to go climb Mount Everest. Mm-hmm. And I, I can tell from the look on your face and the smile, you, you think I was crazy. And, and most of them thought the same thing. So I, I just kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And I kept going after it more and more and more. And I, I didn't let anything get in my way to, to tell me no. Mm. And did you develop, like, did you put together a pitch to say, all right, this is what I'm going to say to, you know, I know you've, you've said it quite clearly there. And when you were getting the pushbacks, did you alter it? Did you do, do anything different or, or what, when that one out of the hundred came on board, what was different? I think what was different was as opposed to, and I still do this in life too, as opposed to telling people what I was going to do, I asked them, what would it take for a corporation to support what I was doing? Mm. So I, I put more effort into what they were looking for as opposed to what I was looking for. Because in my mind, I, I wanted to be the first survivor to climb Everest and use that as a platform to give other survivors and other people who are touched by cancer hope. In their minds, they wanted to use it as a platform for their corporation, as a platform for advertising, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So I, I started approaching it saying, hey, I'm a two-time cancer survivor. I have, I have one functioning lung and I would to hear how you could work with me and how I can work with you to develop a mutually uh, supportive relationship to get the first cancer survivor to the top of the world. Brilliant. Yeah, that definitely that switch makes a huge difference. And I know from talking to people, coaching, you know, just even other people I talk to on the podcast, uh, one, for some reason springs to mind, a guy who was looking for trying to get the door in, in, in the door, working with a, the New Zealand rugby team, for example, um, and he asked, he asked for advice from one of the the, the 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 main coaches, as opposed to you know his ultimate goal was to try and start working with them, but asking for advice, what would somebody do to try? What would they have to do to try and get you know to work with a, an elite coaching group, and and that kind of opened the door. So I think that's very profound in a way, and very important message for people to think about. You know, don't always be looking for what you want. Look for what the the common the common win win could be. I suppose. Exactly. I, I think when when you come to that middle ground, you you it, you make everyone happy. 
And that, that's what it's all about. It's, it's not being selfish on, hey, this is what I want to do. It's, it's reaching out and doing what's best for the majority of people. Mm -hmm. So from that call to, to, to nine months later, you climbed Mount Everest. Is that, is that how it played out? Like, and what sort of shape <laughs> were you in at the start? You must have been pretty fit. You must have been pretty active. I, before, before this, I, I had always been active. I had been a swimmer for years, uh, across country track. I, I even pole vaulted for crying out loud. Mm -hmm. I, I think I tried everything after my cancer was I, cause I just wanted to get out there and, and live. So like I said earlier, when I was living in Jacksonville, Florida, this is where the idea of Everest came up and believe it or not, the highest point in Florida is the top of the four seasons hotel in Miami. Right. So I didn't think that would be, that's not great, great training ground for the, the Himalayan mountains. So I packed up my car, my Honda Civic, my brother and I loaded everything that we owned in the Honda Civic and drove to Estes Park, Colorado and started climbing. I literally did something every single day to, to get my body in shape. And the highest mountain at that time, uh, when we were living in Estes was Long's Peak and it's 18 miles round trip and it's 14,256 feet, I think. Mm -hmm. And I would do that once a week with some weight in my backpack and I would, I would slowly increase the weight to eventually a hundred pounds. Wow. And over the course of how many months were you kind of building that up to, well, I suppose what was the next kind of peak for you to, to work towards Everest? Everest was my first big mountain, believe it or not. I, I went from Colorado, where the highest point is roughly, we'll just round it up, 14,500 feet, uh, which is, as, as you probably know, half the size of Everest. I mean, when I got to Everest Base Camp, every step after that was a, a, a personal height record for me. Mm. So even just being on the mountain, I was happy. And it, and it wasn't about reaching the summit. I mean, obviously, it ultimately was. But it was about setting a goal and, and, and being on the mountain. That's, that was success for me. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and I enjoyed every single moment. And I think uh, I, I take that attitude onto the Kilimanjaro trips that I do. The, the average summit rate on Kilimanjaro is, I want to say, 48%. But with my groups, we're at 98% because we do things differently. We have a wonderful time. And I think the summit becomes a byproduct of having fun. Mm -hmm. Do you remember on your first climb of Everest, have you, have you climbed it more than once? No, once is enough. That's, I'm done. <laughs> do, do you remember going up that, like like everybody, you know, this negative talk going on in our mind, you know, all the time uh, in, in some people's minds and you, you have to develop a relationship with that. Do you remember anything standing out going up Everest that t telling you that you're not good enough, you're not going to do this, it's not going to work, you know, all the negatives. How how strong was that? Was there at any point were you close to turning back and, you know, what, I guess, what pushed you through? There, there was one moment where I was at camp three. So going up from the South side, there are four camps. So there, there's base camp, then camp one, two, three, and four. And from the fourth camp is where you stage your summit ascent. And we were at the third camp on our way to the fourth camp. The goal is to sleep at camp three, uh, just one night, <clears throat> excuse me, and then go to camp four, rest, and then leave in the middle of the evening. I woke up with high altitude cerebral edema. So my I basically has high altitude induced swelling of the brain. Wow. And I put myself on oxygen, uh, slept on oxygen that entire day. And I was on oxygen the rest of that night, woke up the day after and felt 100% better. Mm -hmm. And it, it turned out, believe it or not, it turned out to be blessing in disguise because everyone else who was at camp three on our same, the same schedule we were on to go from three to four and then summit. I come down with, with high altitude induced swelling of the brain. I can't physically move. Everyone else takes off, goes to camp four. They attempt the summit push that night. Weather turns bad. They had to turn around. They lost their opportunity to summit. So if I wouldn't have had the, the high altitude cerebral edema holding me back, I wouldn't have summited. Mm -hmm. So I, I honestly think I have uh, the world's worst good luck. <laughs> and every so many bad things happen to me, but it's it's all about perspective. Mm -hmm. And I also think that I have a a fleet of guardian angels working on overtime, and they're they're probably getting tired of me by now. But that was that was the one moment that I, I thought it was over, mm -hmm. but it, it eventually passed. And as you said, with with the, the the PMA, the positive mental attitude, I wasn't there telling myself, "Don't stop, don't stop." I kept telling myself, literally. Every single step with my left foot, I would tell myself the higher I go with my right foot, I would tell myself the stronger I get. 
the higher I go, the stronger I get. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's amazing how you're right. Your brain believes it and your, your body keeps pushing forward. You know, whether you think you're, it's, it's, it's possible or not, you're absolutely right. Mm-hmm. It's a habit as well. You know, you've developed that habit over time of, of getting through these tough moments. So your brain and every part of you starts believing, yeah, it's just another challenge that you've, you know, come this far, I would imagine. When you summited and came back down, had you prior to the summit thought about what next for you or, or how did, how did your planning kind of evolve from there? Well, since we spent about a month and a half on the mountain living in tents, I, I think, uh, my first thought of what next was probably when, when can I get a shower <laughs> mm, <laughs> when I get home, how can I clean up? But it, it didn't uh, dawn on me until a little bit later, maybe a year later, I thought about uh, doing what's called the seven summits, which is the highest mountain on every continent. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then that in itself takes a lot of planning. I actually interviewed Colin O'Brady on this show a yeah. few years ago and he, I think he did, he did them and the two, the two poles as well. And obviously he put a lot of planning into it. I would imagine that took a lot of planning or did you kind of go gung ho for, for all of them as well? What, what was involved in that? There, there was a lot of planning and, and a lot of it is logistical planning, especially getting to Antarctica, just because you, you know, you can't hop on travelocity.com and book a flight from Denver, Colorado to the South Pole. Um, that was, was a lot of logistical planning, but I, I had a, a, a deeper reason for doing what I was doing on, on the summit of Everest. I had a flag and the whole time that I was climbing, I had a reason, my, my value, my, my inspiration was to get other people to the, the, the summit with me. And I had a, a flag that was probably about two feet by two feet, a silk flag. So I, I cut down on weight and on that flag were names of people touched by cancer. And on the bottom of the flag, it said, dedicated to all those affected by cancer in this small world, keep climbing. Mm -hmm. And I had that in my chest pocket always. Every time I left base camp, I had that in my chest pocket close to my heart as a constant reminder of my goals. And I took a flag up the summit of Everest, and I put a flag also on the highest point on every continent and the the south and the north poles with people who who have been touched by cancer, people who are in remission, people who unfortunately who have passed away, or people who are, are, are battling. Because if, if they're going through what they're going through and they can battle through that, they, they, they can't pick up the satellite phone and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm going to take some time off and I think I'm going to come back next year. I'm done. You know, I can always pick up the phone and, and get a, a rescue helicopter to come get me or, or a plane or something like that. You know, they don't have that option. So if, if they can battle through and continue to forge forward in the, in the face of what they're, what they're battling, I can push and, and survive through a harsh windstorm. You know, I can survive a little frostbite on a toe. You know, it's not the end of the world. So I always keep that in mind. Mm-hmm. No, it's, it's so inspirational. And obviously it's had a huge impact on so, so many people as a result of all of these summits and, and, and the polls. What was their reaction like? What were you starting to to get? What sort of energy was coming your way that kind of helped you, I suppose, keep going? Well, I, I think the energy that that people started giving me, the the positive reinforcement that people kept pushing my way, saying that I was changing their lives. And whenever I did give a, a presentation or whenever I give a, a keynote talk, I, I make it a point to try as, as hard as I can to go visit a local hospital and share my survivorship story with the patients because I get a lot out of the people who are laying in bed fighting. And I think they get a lot out of what's, what's going on in, in, in my life. In fact, one of the, um, the most emotional ones was I was giving a presentation at, I believe it was an American cancer society event in the United States. And there was a long queue of people after my talk to, to just come up and, and converse with me and, and share stories. And as I was finishing up with one lady, the next person I could tell that she had been crying because her mascara was running down her face and she was just a, a mess. Mm-hmm. She came up to me. She, she latched on by hugging me, buried her face in my chest and she lost it. And, and it took all the strength I had to, to, to not get choked up and, and get, you know, to, to join her. And she finally composed herself. She leaned back and she started looking at me and she grabbed my face. And she told me that in the past six months, she lost her son to cancer. She lost her husband to cancer, mm. and she got diagnosed for the third time with cancer. 
And she also told me that she had in the hotel room a bottle of sleeping pills and enough alcohol to, to knock out a horse. She mm-hmm. had written a suicide note as well. And she told me that she forced herself to go to one more presentation, one more talk. And it just happened to be mine. And she looked me right in the eyes and she said, you saved my life. Mm-hmm. That's why I do what I do. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, I'm sure that's not just for her. And obviously, there's probably so many other people that you haven't met that that have had that massive impact on. Do you ever get a bad, do you ever have a bad day then? Like, when you have a bad day, what do you do to overcome that? What, what, you know, what, what are your support circle like? What do you need to lean on? Because you're inspiring others. But when you have a bad day yourself, what, what kind of gets you out of that? No, oh, if if I had never had a bad day, I'd I'd be lying. You know, if I told you I'd never had a bad day, it just wouldn't be the truth. You know, everybody has bad days. It's just you have to think about what you're actually thinking about when you're having those bad days, and and really tap into your core values. But also to understand and know that that bad time, that bad moment, is just that. It's a temporary state. It's not a permanent condition. And I think a lot of people don't understand that, hey, you know, just because I feel depressed, just because I feel sad at, in this moment, it's not going to last forever. So one of the things I do is, is on Monday, I actually have Monday me time. And I'm, I'm probably one of the few men who's actually going to admit I, I take a bath. I take a bathtub and I relax. I listen to some music. I'll, you know, maybe play on my phone or I'll, I'll sit and I'll, I'll meditate or I'll just clear my mind and I'll spend an hour just just me, nothing. Mm-hmm. You know, no interruptions, nada. And I think that really helps. But it also helps having a certain pattern that you follow every day. So we were talking earlier via email. You know, I, I get up at five in the morning as well. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I've, I've convinced myself to do is when my alarm goes off, I don't hit snooze. And the reason I don't hit snooze is because if I hit snooze, I'm psychologically or, or subconsciously telling myself, ah, you know, today's not that big of a deal. I'm not too excited to get to it. But if I get out of bed, the instant my alarm goes off, I'm telling myself over and over and over, developing a pattern, hey, I'm here. I'm excited for today. Let's do it. Bring it on. Mm -hmm. So I think those patterns really help people. And once you develop those patterns, you develop a program in your brain to help you continuously move on the proper path. That's right for you. Yeah. Oh, I couldn't agree more. Uh, The 5 a.m. piece. I normally kind of leave the first thing I want to do that next morning as something I'm really excited to do. And and that, that always fires me up straight away because any morning that I'm hit snooze or, or leave it that miss that hour, I'm not right for the whole day afterwards because I'm always kind of feeling like I'm catching up. And it's not because, you know, you might, you give yourself a hard time because you're catching up because you didn't get it. Like it, it, that, that's not even it. It's just that if I can get up and do the, two or three things that I really am passionate about doing, I know then if nothing else happens for the whole day, I've I've achieved something and I, I feel like I'm going in that right direction. And, and that's that's hugely important for me. And, and, and it's good that you share that. What, what other kind of key tools or approaches do you typically share when you're coaching people, talking, uh, you know, giving the motivational talks that, that help people take that first step, take that 1% move in the right direction. That That's easy to start because a lot of the times people say, oh, practicing self-awareness or meditation, it's not for me. You know, they, they put up the, the blocker straight away. What, what else do you find very useful and, and practical? Oh, I, th- I think one of the most powerful things that somebody could do to develop a more positive, optimistic mindset, how many people, when they wake up in the morning, they turn on the news? 90% maybe. How many people, when they go to bed, they turn on the news? 90% maybe. How how much of the news is negative? Mm-hmm. 99.99% of the news is probably negative. Mm-hmm. So why would you bookend your day on a negative note? You're constantly programming your brain with negative patterns, negative thoughts, negative, negative, negative. If you wake up in the morning And the first thing that most people do is they grab their phone, they get on social media, they turn on the news, whatever it might be, you know, grab your phone instead of turn the news and go to social media. The first thing you do, Google inspirational videos, Mm -hmm. you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever it might be, whatever video matters to you, whatever, whatever you want to do to start your day off on a positive note. 
And then at the end of the day, grab a journal. In fact, I've developed a journal. Go to SeanSwarner.com. You, you get it. Mm-hmm. Um, you write down five things that you're grateful for that happened that day. Not necessarily your your home, your house, stuff like that, because you're always grateful for those things. But five things that happened that day in particular that you were incredibly grateful for and journal on one of them. And not just what it was, but write down why it's important to you, how it made you feel. Because then you're tapping into your personal core values and you're understanding what's most meaningful to you. So now you're bookending your day on a positive note. Yes, the news is there. Yes, we know it's negative. Why inundate yourself with it? Change it. Mm -hmm. change what's being what's programming your brain because if you don't program your brain it'll be programmed for you Mm -hmm. no totally a a similar thing i've done on my phone when i get up at five i have um all apps locked out until 6 a.m now i can easily override it but it just prevents (laughs) me from looking at any of the bad apps for like I, my podcast app is is uh not never locked out so i can listen to something that nourishes my brain as opposed to going because you will end up just clicking on twitter and seeing something negative because the the, the news and, and and it's called negative negativity bias i think it's called and um we are vulnerable to it that's the way uh, we we we, uh, suck up negativity more than positivity it's just the way we are and the news preys on that and you know everything about coronavirus and all of that of course it's really negative but you know the news just just feeds on it because it's a business a lot of the time you know Absolutely. Absolutely. And and looking at the news and the media and and Twitter, social media, whatever it might be, people need to realize that there's a difference between fear and danger. You know, you, you might be afraid of something, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're in danger of being hurt. Mm -hmm. No, totally. Totally. You mentioned fear. How do you deal with fear? Guinness? No, I'm kidding. (laughs) How do I deal with fear? I think one of the one of the first things I do is I, I I sort of center myself because anybody who's depressed is living in the past. Anyone who's anxious or fearful is living in the future. Mm-hmm. And one of the biggest things that happens is when someone's fearful or, or myself, but when I'm fearful, that's when my brain starts going out of control and it asks a question: What if? And it instantly goes to the negative. It instantly instantly goes to the worst case scenario, mm-hmm. you know. And that that basically is giving my permission, my brain permission. When I say "what if," it's giving my brain permission to just go into imagination land and come up with any crazy potential, crazy idea it can think of. So the first thing I do is I realize it, it's not happening. It's not right now. So I put my hand. If I'm really stressing out, I put my hand on my stomach and I just slowly breathe. And then I start listening to, you know, I seeing five things. So uh, there's something that um, I, I'm working on right now, um, and I'll try to share it with you succinctly, but it's five, four, three, two, one. Breathe, and it's using all the other senses. Mm-hmm. Look for five things that are around me. Um, hear four things. Smell three things. Um, I know I'm missing one. No, S- feel, feel three things, too. Yeah, you know what I'm getting at. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but just put your, you, you ground yourself in the present moment. And I think that really, really helps because it stops your brain from wondering what if, and it stops your brain from projecting what could potential, what potential catastrophe could happen in the future. Mm-hmm. No, it's a, it's a good tool. I've something similar from, from coaching that I would use as well. And, um, like a lot of these though, it's easier to say them. It, it's, 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 it's the, the doing, uh, that, that is the key. And, you know, there's probably lots of things that we've shared already on this that people can just put into practice, but it is all about putting it into practice, right? So what about the last, you know, the last couple of years, what have been the big moments for you in the last few years that have kept you moving forward, that have kept giving you that sense of purpose, you know, aligning to your own core values? What were the standout achievements for you since, you know, the last couple of years? Well, I would say the the, the biggest, not necessarily, well, I guess it would be achievement depending on, on who you ask and how you look at it. Uh, I got married recently. Mm, congratulations. So, <laughs> I appreciate it. I've, I've been told by numerous people that marriage is more difficult than climbing ever. So maybe that's the next big adventure. <laughs> well, well done on, on that. And, and that's a whole new kind of chapter, I suppose, that uh, is, is opening up in front of you right now. Um, what What is next on the agenda? Speaking of the, the next chapter, I know we talked at the start, Kilimanjaro, hopefully in, in July. 
in parallel to that you're you're a writer you do a lot of keynote speaking what what else keeps you motivated what are and even what are those challenges what are the things that you're aspiring to do next honestly i think i'm aspiring to change the world one person at a time because i want people to make conscious decisions surrounded by their personal core values which is why i'm developing the summit challenge you know it it really helps people understand what they value most and how they can get it and and, and if people have those those guiding principles those foundations in life. Yeah. And, and I know that if, if I'm on my deathbed and I've changed one person's life, that's all that matters. You know, I want to leave the place uh, better than I found it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you've already definitely impacted more than one person so far. Uh, and, and that's, uh, you know, a good thing to, to have and to know, but like, I suppose a lot, a lot of people like you, that, you know, there's always the next person, there's always one more. And that's probably what continues to drive you to drive you forward I, I would imagine i'm going to leave you with one more question um and it's always about learning it's you're a very big learner like myself what's the last thing that you've learned that was very impactful to you i'm uh, putting you on the spot but just take a second is there anything that comes up that you said wow that's really caught me and and is meaningful y yes so I was giving a presentation not too long ago. I was up on stage talking about what it was like with one lung climbing into the death zone, which is 26,000 feet, 8,000 meters and above on Everest. And I was explaining and, and trying to relate to people what it was like breathing with one lung on the summit of Mount Everest. And it, it hit me while I was on stage. No one can relate to this. Mm-hmm. So that's when I started realizing I, I need to have more stories. People, people love the comeback story, but they also relate, relate to the child when I was younger. They relate to the person when I was in college. And I think if, if, if people realize that I'm a normal guy, you know, just a normal, normal kid growing up in, in Willard, Ohio, you know, but if, if I can literally crawl my first goal was to crawl eight feet from the hospital bed to the toilet, you know, so I literally, so I wouldn't vomit on myself, you know, mm -hmm. without getting too descriptive. Uh, and then I eventually climbed to 29,000 feet to the top of the world. If I can do that and overcome everything that I've gone through and, and, and have accomplished, you can do anything you want to as well with a proper tool set and taking action, like you said. So I think the biggest thing I learned was it's it's not about the accomplishments. It's about giving back and keeping things relatable. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Yeah, that's a, a really good one. And it's interesting, as you said, though, the the one lung on Mount Everest, it, it, it's difficult to relate anyone as you can not relate to that. They can imagine what that's like, but it's difficult to to connect. But but talking about everyday things that people can connect to is, is very powerful and and i'm sure lots of folks will have connected to uh to this conversation sean so as we wrap up maybe give a shout out on your new adventure your uh your new challenges how people can get in touch yeah uh, that's I, how people can get in touch i think that's the easiest question you've asked me so far <laughs> they can just go to sean swanner.com sean spelled the proper way s-e-a-n uh, and the Warner Brothers with an S on the front, seanswarner.com. It's the easiest way. Very good. Great stuff. Well, look, it was great meeting you, great talking to you. Um, if you're ever climbing any small mountains here in Ireland in the future, definitely let me know. Uh, we'll, we'll meet up. And uh, best of luck for the future. And I hope, you know, things settle down, that the lockdown eases. Uh, you can get uh, on, on on the plane and, and Kilimanjaro and the end of July can can happen. Cool. Well, I, I definitely appreciate it, and I'm very grateful for your time, so thank you. Great stuff. I'm looking forward to putting it out, and hopefully, uh, all going well with my editing, it'll be out tomorrow as we, uh, as we talk about that. Fantastic. Thanks again. Great stuff, Sean. Thank you. Hey, folks. Thanks so much for listening to the show. If you enjoyed it, could you please consider helping me extend the reach of the podcast that a little bit further? You can do that in a number of ways. The number one way is to subscribe on your app of choice. This helps me with the chart ranking, leading to more folks stumbling across the podcast and checking it out. 
you could also repost it on your social media channels any of them would be great and maybe even tell a friend in person or over the phone pick up the phone give them a call and tell them about the one percent better podcast tell them about this episode or one that you've heard in the past and he will do I would really appreciate it. In the last year, we set up a 1% Better Slack community, which you can join for free and interact with me and other members of the community and improve through holding each other accountable and sharing monthly challenges. It's a lot of fun. Check it out. I'm into season four of this incredible journey and the more of these interviews and solo shows that I research, record and share, the better I believe that they get and more loaded with actionable takeaways that you can learn from. I know I've learned so much from it so far and it's always really, really fulfilling and rewarding when I hear from you on what you took from it. So do reach out, rob at robofthegreen.ie. And of everybody that listens, 90% listen and enjoy, but only around 10% actually take action, write down takeaways and put them into practice. I am convinced that if we can move that number a bit higher, the listeners will not only make steps forward towards their goals, but they will be more fulfilled and happy and better. Change doesn't happen overnight. It is hard, but it's all about taking the first step, whatever that is for you. You can absolutely do this. Make a plan, be deliberate, take action. Don't overreach. Start with those small incremental improvements and over time you will see great progress. It's all in the pursuit of betterness. So again, thank you so much for listening. Good luck and stay safe.